Hello and welcome to Bible study, where tonight we continue our study in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I find this book to be um, fascinating, and I hope that you do too. There's so much insight in this book. Uh, tonight, we uh, are beginning our study uh, towards the end of chapter 11, and it will finish about in the middle of chapter 12. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we share together. Thank you for your word. Lord, please open our hearts and minds to your word. Give us the understanding that only you can through your Holy Spirit. Please send your Holy Spirit down upon us. And as always, Lord, keep me from getting in the way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Acts chapter 11, starting at the 19th verse, it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he, had, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in those days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Holy Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. They, this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, a brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the gate were keeping the present. Prison. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So they went out. So he went out and followed him, and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out, went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. That's we're going to stop tonight. Okay, again, um, 
This is all happening after the dispersion of the Jewish folks, the Jewish believers of the way, okay, were dispersed from Jerusalem. And it says here, now that those were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. Remember, Stephen was the one who was stoned. Back in chapter 7, we read about him. He was the first Christian martyr, okay? So then after the persecution, they were scattered, and they traveled as far as Phoenicia, which is about 100 miles north, Cyprus, which is an island about 225 miles west, Antioch, which is about 300 miles north, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Now, why would they be doing that? Well, it's mostly because they were still, they were Jews, and they were going into the synagogues because they were used to going to the synagogue every Saturday, and this is what they continue to do. And they were preaching Jesus. They're preaching Christ crucified. But it goes on to say in verse 20, but some of them were men from Cyprus, again, and Cyrene. Now, Cyrene is North Africa, right? And that's about 750 miles west of Jerusalem. All these are a long ways off, especially when you're traveling by foot. You know, for the most part, that was the transportation. So those who, when they came to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. Now the Hellenists are the Gentiles. So now we're not only preaching to the Jews, we're also preaching to the Gentiles. Preaching the Lord, the Lord Jesus. And verse 21, it says, the hand of the Lord was with them, uh, which is vital for the presentation of the gospel. It truly is vital to have the hand of the Lord with you when you're presenting the gospel. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it could be that here you are and you have a friend or loved one who is could even be flat against Christianity and everything else, and you want to share the gospel with them. Guess what? You can have the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And they may reject it, but you have the power within you as a believer, those of us who are believers, have the power within us to present the gospel because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, said that the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 22, then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas. Now remember, he's the encourager guy, right? Who sold his property and gave the proceeds of that to the apostles right at the beginning when we were beginning our study in the book of Acts. Now, it, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, Antioch was for, founded in 300 BC by Seleucus I, one of the inheritors of Alexander the Great's empire. He liked to make a city and then name it after his father, Antioch. And he did this about 15 times. This city of Antioch was called Syrian Antioch or Antioch on the Orontes. In the first century, it was a city of more than a half a million people. Now today, it's a Turkish city with about a population of about 3,500. Things have changed. F.F. Uh, Bruce says the city's reputation for moral laxity was enhanced by the cult of Artemis and Apollo at Daphne, about five miles distant, where the ancient Syrian worship of Astarar, Astarte and her consort with its ritual prostitution was carried on. You know, you, you see this time and time again in the, in the New Testament, well, actually, in the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, how's that? About these pagan religions that have, that have ritual prostitution. <laughs> you know, again, it's a god of sex, which pretty much is the god of this world, too. We can go on and on about that, but things haven't changed much. Now, verse 23, when he, Barnabas, came and had seen the grace of God, 
which is the great number of people who came to the Lord, right? He was glad and encouraged them all. There's that encourager guy, right? Encouraged them all with purpose of heart. Uh, they should continue with the Lord. He can encourage them to continue with the Lord. For he, again, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Again, this is exponential growth in the church. Again, it means the Lord's got to be with you for this growth. Now, verse 25, when then Barnabas departed Tarsus to seek Saul. Now, let's just get a little bit of history on why Saul of Tarsus is in Tarsus. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 9. First off, we're going to look at the 15th verse. Okay, and this is God talking to Ananias. Remember, Ananias was not too real wild about going to, to uh, see Saul because Ananias knew his reputation as being a bad motor scooter, right? So here it is. But the Lord said to him, Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before what? The Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. So number one, the Gentiles. That's what, here we got Barnabas bringing him to Antioch. Now, next is, uh, we're going to look at 29 and 30, chapter 9 yet. And he spoke boldly, meaning Saul, of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. Now, our hero, Saul, later known as Paul, has been in Tarsus for about 13 years. He's been there for quite a bit of time. Now, verse 26 says, And when he had found him, Barnabas had found Saul, he brought him to Antioch. So it was for a whole year that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, David Guzik points out that this combination of a great formal teaching preaching. Remember, our hero Saul here was a Pharisee of Pharisees. So he'd had formal education. And so this is he could do the formal teaching and preaching and the combination of great informal teaching and preaching made the church community in Antioch something special and world impacting. You know, and that's really it. A pastor friend of mine ended up taking a call to a church that was nearby a university. And he told me, you know, this is, this is Lutheran church, so we're, we can either have a real traditional service or a quote unquote contemporary service. Well, he said to me, he says, you know what, Willie, I, these guys are all professors and I got to preach to professors. You know, not the regular, regular Joes, like hopefully you and I are, but they're, hopefully I also have some people that are pretty bright. I know I do listening to this as well. So, okay, here we have this combination of somebody who really, doing the high level one of preaching and teaching, and another guy is sitting at right, right in the center. Pretty slick. Okay, now, Christians. Uh, the Latin ending of I-A-N means uh, the party of, or, as Boyce stated, Christ ones. Okay, that's pretty interesting. So the I-A-N means that, well, okay, I guess I'm an Arizonian. That means I'm part of Arizona now, or once was Californian. Now, here's another interesting note. Ironside said that when he was traveling in China years ago, he was frequently introduced as Yasu Yan. At first, he did not know what the word meant, but he asked, but he asked about it and learned that Yasu was Cantonese for word for the word Jesus. And, well, and Yan was man. So he's being introduced as Jesus man. Now Eusebius, the uh, famous early church historian, described a believer named Sanctus from Lyons, France, who was tortured for Jesus. As they tortured him cruelly, they hoped to get him to say something evil or blasphemous. 
They asked his name, and he only replied, I am a Christian. What nation do you belong to? He answered, I am a Christian. What city do you, belong, do you live in? I am a Christian. His questioners began to get angry. Are you a slave or a free man? I am a Christian, was his only reply. No matter what they asked about him, he only answered, I am a Christian. This made his torturers all the more determined to break him, but when they could not, he died with the words, I am a Christian, on his lips. I think that's something for us to aspire to. Uh, you know, those there are Christians who get a bad rap, just like auto mechanics and attorneys and contractors, whatever, that aren't really doing as we ought. But we need to be, as uh, Ironside was called, we need to be Jesus man or woman. Okay. Now, in 20, verse 27 says, And in these days, prophets from Jerusalem came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, the Roman Empire, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Okay, so in other words, this is something that is uh, recorded in antiquity, not just here in Scripture. Then the disciples, those who follow Christ, and all of us who are Christians are disciples of Christ, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Now, this is truly showing Christian charity. This is something that we need to aspire to do. And I believe that, well, I know many of you uh, do exactly that. Okay. When called upon, you know, it's interesting that prior to having the proliferation of the dole, welfare and all, uh, churches took care of people. Isn't that interesting? But then when the state took it over, uh, they kind of kicked churches to the curb. Hmm. Okay, now verse 30 says, This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now into chapter 12, verse 1, it says, now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some in the church. Now, a lot of Herods. This one happens to be Herod Agrippa I, who was the nephew of Herod Antipas, who was the murderer of John the Baptist. And he was also the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the guy who ordered the killing of all the young boys in uh, Bethlehem trying to rid himself of Jesus. Now, this guy was not a Jew, but an Edomite. And again, this guy was appointed by the Romans to be the king over the Jews there in Jerusalem. And they resented the heck out of this guy. They didn't much care for him. So what does it say? Verse 2 says, Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. James, the brother of John. Remember, we had the sons of thunder that Jesus would call them, the sons of Zebedee. James was brother to John, who wrote this, wrote the, uh, the gospel, John, the book of Revelation, uh, other, uh, the epistles of John. Anyway, they put him, he had him put to death. Herod had James put to death by the sword, which means he was beheaded. Now, Verse 3 says, and because he sought please the Jews, okay, here he is, he's trying to get in good with them, trying to up his popularity, right? He proceeded to seize Peter also, okay? He's going to keep on getting his popular. Help him come up in the polls, if, as it were. Now, it was during the days of the unleavened bread, which is the time of the Passover. So when he arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him. So this was high security. And again, remember, they got all this stuff. It's kind of like when Jesus was crucified, they wanted to be sure to get him off the cross. So nothing was going on like that on Passover. Hmm. So this way, Herod is keeping Peter in prison until after Passover, and then he's going to bring him out, right? Okay, now, 
Again, high security, four squads of soldiers to keep him, attending to bring him before the people after Passover, trying to increase his popularity. Verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. There's that constant, intense prayer that is so, so beneficial. Here it says the word constant also has the idea of earnest. Literally, word pictures someone stretching out all they can for something. The verb ectonos is related to ectones, a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Now, Luke uses this same word, ectonos, for the agonizing prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you probably remember from that, that Jesus was, he was praying so earnestly that the sweat was dripping like blood from his brow. And what did he say? He said, if this cup can be taken from me, please you know, do this, but not my will, but your will be done. That's how we need to pray in earnest and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And this is what's going on for Peter as he's in prison. Verse six is, and when Herod was about to bring him out, he's going to have him executed, probably have his head lopped off, just like, like James. At night, Peter was sleeping. <laughs> how do you like that? Peter was sleeping. He wasn't sitting there wringing his hands, worrying about anything that was going on. He put his trust in the Lord. Gee whiz, I wish that I could always do that. I don't know about you, but there are nights when I worry about the silliest things. And it, it, if I would just stop and say something as simple as Jesus, which I have done, and get rid of that worry. So here we have Peter, who is about to be executed. Here he is sleeping, right? He's bound with two chains between two soldiers. Somebody mentioned at one time, this was really a great place for him to witness the gospel. Because these guys can't get away from him. They can't say, oh, I don't want to listen to this. <laughs> They're stuck there with him. Okay. Now, bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. High security. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and the light shone in prison. And he struck Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and the chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did, and he said to him, Put on your garments and follow me. The Message Bible has a really great uh, uh, translation of this. I just love it. It says, suddenly there is an angel at his side and a light flooding the room. The angel shook Peter and got him up. Hurry. The handcuffs fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed, put on your shoes. And Peter did it. Then grab your coat and let's get out of here. <laughs> let's get out of here. Let's get out of Dodge. So verse 9, he went out and followed him. So Peter went out and followed the angel and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Kind of like back in chapter 10, where he sees this vision of this big sheep sheet being lowered down with all of these unclean animals and the voice saying, kill and eat. And he says, oh, no, I can't. Nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. That was a vision. So here's Peter thinking the same thing. Now, verse 10, when they're past the first and second guard posts, they came to, again, high security, the iron gate that leaves the city which opened to them of its own accord. Hmm, this is miraculous, wouldn't you say? And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand 
of Herod and of all the expectation of the Jewish people. Those who were looking so forward to his execution. F.F. F. Bruce relates the story of Sundar Singh, a Tibetan Christian, who was likewise freed miraculously from prison for preaching the gospel. He was thrown into a well and the cover set over it and scaredly lot. He would be left in the well until he died and he could see the bones of and rotting corpses of those who had already perished in there. Now, the third night of his imprisonment, he heard someone locking the cover of the well and removing it. A voice told him to take a hold of the rope that was being lowered. Sundar was grateful that the rope had a loop in it as he could put his foot in because he had injured his arm in the fall down into the well. He was raised up, the cover was replaced and locked, but when he looked to thank his rescuer, he could find no one. When the morning came, he went back to the same place where he was arrested and started preaching again. News of his preaching came to the official who had him arrested, and Sundar was brought before him again. When the official said, someone must have gotten the key and released him, they searched for the key and found it on the official's own belt. Once again, miraculous. These things do continue to go on. This is not just something that's just done in biblical times. God has the right purposes for these things, okay? These are the things that, you know, God doesn't let us in on everything, but what he does let us in on are the things that we need to know. You know, try, try to, try to uh, uh, describe the Trinity in a, every illustration I've ever heard falls short. That's one of those things that are a mystery. And it's back to us, finite minds trying to understand an infinite God. He gives us what we need to know, and that's it. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like my dad said to me one time when I was relating a story of some of my exploits as a young man in a hot rod. He looked at me and says, I'll hear these on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> I think God leaves us with things on a need-to-know basis. Okay, with that, um, questions, comments, or small rallic remarks. Again, anytime you have any, please get in contact with me. You may notice that these, <coughs> pardon me, these videos are taken down after 30 days on Facebook. What you may not know is that you can find them on the Hot Rod Bible Study YouTube page, and also they are up on the Hot Rod Bible Study website, hotrodbiblestudy.com, for a period of time as well. But the YouTube ones stay on for, well, till YouTube decides they want to have them up for 30 days too or something like that. But you can find them if you desire to go back or watch them later on. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, this one's taken down. You can find it on the Hot Rod Bible Study YouTube page. Uh, so do that. Uh, and uh, tonight I want to lift up a couple of people in prayer. Uh, first of all, I'd like to lift up Pastor Ed Ray and his entire family as his beloved wife, Ray Lynn, passed away this past Monday. Uh, she'd been battling cancer for some time, and she was just, just an example of what a Christian woman ought to be. Also, I want to lift up our friend uh, Louis Poole, who had a pretty good fall and shattered his heel. Let's put him, put him on, uh, put him out of out of commission for about three months. Which is a pretty tough deal for a hot rodder who's got all these things planned. So, with that, let's lift them up in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, the God of all comfort and love, I pray that you. Wrap your loving arms around Ed and the entire Ray family, the entire extended family, all of those who mourn the loss of Ray Lynn. I thank you also for knowing her 
and also for her service here, for her love for you and her desire to share the gospel with people worldwide. Thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, lift up my buddy Louie, that you heal him in accordance with your grace and mercy, that, uh, that you <laughs> give him the patience he's going to need. And again, that hopefully the healing goes even faster than the doctors have decided. And with that, I'd like to say, now may the peace of God that transcends all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>